In today's video, we're going to play through seven quests in The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. These missions range from simple fetch quests to fighting waves of enemies, all the way to locking up a corrupt guardsman. At the end of the video, we'll share some opinions on these quests and rate them on how fun they were slash could have been. The first quest for today is titled Imperial Corruption. We'll receive this quest by either talking to Laronk Gro Glurzog or his friend Ruslan. Ruslan and Laronk can either be found in the Imperial City Temple District or in the Market District. Due to their varying schedules, I had to go seek them out at Laronk's house in the Temple District. The conversation with Laronk went something like this. Hey stranger, can you spare a few coins? I've just been shaken down by that bastard watchman and he took my last septim. The bastard took every coin I had with me. I don't know his name, but I know his face. Ruslan and I were shopping at Jensen's when he accused us of stealing. We turned out our pockets to prove we were innocent, but he didn't care. And we had to pay the fine, or he was going to march us off to jail. Now he's shaken down most of the shopkeepers in the market district. They're all too afraid of him to do anything. Jensen wouldn't even talk about it. Someone ought to do something about him. Laronk said that both he and Ruslan were shopping in the Imperial City Market District when a corrupt guardsman accused both of them of stealing. They proved their innocence, but nevertheless, the corrupt guardsman made them both pay an unfair fine. Apparently, this happened at Jensen's Good as New merchandise, and even Jensen was a witness to this all. However, she didn't say a single thing. Speaking with Ruslan, he just reiterates the same points that Laronk mentioned. At this point, the journal now directs us to go to Jensen and speak with her about the events that transpired. Entering inside of her shop and speaking with her went like this. Who told you that? Ruslan and Laronk, those idiots don't know when to stay quiet. Look, I'm not telling you anything, stranger. I don't trust you. So through the help of everybody that commented on the last video, I realized that I had to raise her disposition to 70. And unfortunately for me, this meant much more than either just bribing her or casting beguiling touch on her. I began by just selling her a bunch of items that I would pick up on my travels. I even completed unfriendly competition to make her more friendly towards us. I then purchased a few scrolls of beguiling touch. I then equipped every single enchanted item that I had that would enhance both my speechcraft or personality. Finally, putting it all together, we maxed out her disposition through bribery. We equipped a scroll of beguiling touch cast that on her, and then quickly equipped our regular spell of Beguiling Touch, cast that on her, and then spoke to her once more. See anything you like? I guess I can trust you. It's that bastard Auden's Avidius. He's in here every month taking my wares without paying for them. What can I do? He's a captain of the Imperial Watch. Only another watch captain can arrest him. Fat chance of that happening. Jensen finally spilled the beans on who the corrupt Imperial Watchman is. It's a guard captain named Auden's Avidius. We actually had the pleasure of running into him before Jensen told us any of that information. The conversation with him went like this. Can I help you? When the city is quiet, everybody is happy, right? If you like noise, maybe you're in the wrong place. Honestly, the conversation was very brief, and he gave all of the default answers that a normal Imperial Guard would have given. His corruption certainly isn't blatantly obvious like it was with Ulrich Leland over in Shadenhall. Continuing the quest, we head over to an Imperial Guard and speak with them. Morning, sir. If you've got a complaint, tell it to the watch captain. I've got better things to do than listen to you whine. Go see Hieronymus Lex. He's a pompous fool, just like you. He might listen to your complaint. We're directed over to Hieronymus Lex. 
who clearly isn't favored amongst the City Watch, in order to give our complaint. We find Hieronymus Lex wandering around the Arbitorium. Speaking to him went like this. Can I help you? I don't have time for this now. The Grey Fox is on the loose. Take this problem to Itius Hain. He's also a captain of the Imperial Watch. Hieronymus Lex is deep in his search for the Grey Fox, so he can't help us. He directs us over to Idius Hain, another captain of the Watch. Speaking with Idius sounded like this. Can I help you, citizen? Why should I trust your word? You'll have to do better than this to persuade me to take action against one of the other Watch captains. Idius' disposition has to be raised in order for him to hear us out. So, similar to what we had to do with Jensen, we cast Beguiling Touch, use a scroll of Beguiling Touch, and max out the rest of his disposition via bribery. What's that? These are very serious charges. If you can get two witnesses to testify against Alton's of Idius, I'll arrest him. Otherwise, I can't help you. Idius tells us that we need two witnesses to step forward in order to testify against Audens. The compasses direct us either to go to Jensen or Ruslan and Laronk. We tried speaking with Jensen first, and this is what she had to say. See anything you like? You want me to publicly accuse Audens of Vidius of corruption? I'd sooner swim naked in a pool filled with slaughterfish and mud crabs. Jensen made it pretty clear that she does not want to testify against Audens. Our only hope now is to go to Ruslan and Laronk to see if they will. Entering inside of Laronk's house, we spoke with him first. I've heard that you've been asking around about that corrupt guard. Just don't mention my name. I have enough problems. Testify against a watch captain and accuse him of corruption? I don't think I'm willing to risk doing that. Laronk also does not wish to testify against Audens, so we turn to Ruslan. Damn watchman. I've heard that you've been asking around about that corrupt guard. Just don't mention my name. I have enough problems. You want me to testify against Audens of Vidius? You're crazy. Exactly how do you intend to persuade me to do that? After hearing out both of these gentlemen, it's clear that we have to bribe them in order to get them to testify. So, we start off by casting Beguiling Touch, and then we go into the Persuasion game and toss some Septums their way. Thank you. You've convinced me. If I don't stand up to him, who will? I just hope I'm not committing suicide. We managed to convince Ruslan to be one of our witnesses, so now it's time to convince Laronk. We go through the same process of casting Beguiling Touch, and then bribing him, and he says this. Testify against a watch captain? For you, of course. Uh, that'll get you. Uh, that'll get you something. This may be the stupidest thing I've ever done, but I'll testify against Auden Zavidius. I suppose someone has to stand up to him. We've successfully found our two witnesses to stand up against Auden's. Now, according to the journal. All we have to do is make sure that Ruslan and Laronk go see the guard captain Idius in the morning. At this point, I feel like the quest got a little finicky for me. The green compass would just point me towards Idius. Eventually, it would go away, but Ruslan and Laronk were nowhere to be seen. I wouldn't get any journal update, but speaking with Idius would yield new dialogue. I have two witnesses willing to testify against Ardens of Idius. I'll get a warrant. Arrest him. So, Ruslan and Laronk did testify, and Idius says that he's going to write up a warrant and arrest Audens. But, I still didn't have a journal entry update, and I wasn't sure what to do next. So, I decided to wait for 24 hours, and thankfully, when those were up, I did get a journal update. In fact, it said that the quest was now done. So, I decided to go back to Ruslan and Laronk to see if there was any closure dialogue or anything of the sorts. Unfortunately, there were no new conversation topics, and it felt like there was even less to talk about with them. I decided to even go over to Jensen to see if maybe there would have been a reward or just some form of new dialogue. 
Asking about the corrupt watchman, we seem to have actually regressed in our dialogue with her, going back to a place of distrust between her and us. At this point, I was really confused on what to do now, but leaving Jensen's shop, I saw a sight for sore eyes. Idius had arrested Audens and was leading him to prison. I've just been arrested for corruption, so I'm not in the mood to talk. I decided to follow the two over to the Imperial City Prison to see if anything interesting would happen. Unfortunately, when the two men entered inside of the Bastion, Audens was gone. I asked the jailer if I could visit a prisoner, and we went down there, and we were actually able to spot Audens. However, he was just too far out of reach in order for us to interact with him, so we couldn't see any extra dialogue. One thing I did know about this quest, however, was that if we waited exactly 10 in-game days, we would receive a little surprise while being in the Imperial City. If it's a fight you want, it's a fight you'll get! The corrupt watchman himself, Auden Avidius, successfully escaped First, prison and has come after us then, in the Imperial City. In he managed to find a dagger and is now attempting to kill us. First, I'll kill you. Then, I'll get Ruslan and Laurent. You'll all pay for what you did to me! Oh. He even tells us that Ruslan and Laurent, the two gentlemen who were witnesses against him, are next on his hit list. So, with all of that information, we decided it best to finally put down Auden's Avidius. We receive a final quest update saying that Auden's escaped from jail and that he had indeed threatened both Ruslan and Laronk. Looting his body, he has a note on him called Ramblings of Auden's Avidius. Reading it supplies us with the following information. I used to be somebody. I was a captain of the guard in the Imperial City until that flea-bitten hero decided to poke his nose in my business. I have a plan to get out of the Imperial prison. Apparently, there is a secret escape tunnel used by the royal family. When I get out, I'm going to settle the score with that hero. Then, I'll take care of those two snitches, Ruslan and the Ronk. The sweetest of all will be Idius Hain. I'll make him squeal first. Thus ending the quest, Imperial Corruption. We begin our next quest, The Siren's Deception, in the city of Anvil. We're likely to come across a Red Guard woman named Melona. Speaking to her, the conversation goes like this. How would you like to get my husband Gogan out of hot water? Believe me, he'll need all the help he can get to worm his way out of this one. To think he'd fall for the gang's scheme. Oh, I could kill him. I'm sorry. I'm rambling, and you look confused. Let me explain. The women in the gang use their wiles to worm them out to some remote location and rob them blind. It's been going on for some time now. The city guard hasn't done very much about it, because frankly, the men who are robbed are so embarrassed, they don't want to report it. Take, for example, that good-for-nothing husband of mine, Gogan. He cared more about their charms than my own. When Gogan was, uh, with the women, they took something quite valuable from him. No, it's not what you're thinking. He was carrying a precious family heirloom with him when he was lured out to their lair. It was a small ring given to him on our wedding day. The ring belonged to my mother and has been in the family for generations. I'm willing to give you all the money I have to get it back. 100 gold. Can you help us? Thank you. I'm afraid I can't offer you much help, but I'll do what I can. All I can tell you is that the best place to start is at the Flowing Bowl. It's a tavern located outside the city walls near the waterfront. Gogan may be able to give you more information beyond that. Malona told us that there is a gang of women running rampant across Anvil. Apparently, they prey on men and charm them into coming to their secluded cabin where they rob them of all of their personal belongings. This ended up recently happening to Gogan, Malona's husband, where he actually lost their family heirloom, 
were now directed to go speak with Gogan himself to learn more information. What do you want? I see my wife couldn't keep a big mouth shut. Yes, it's true. I lost the family ring to those sirens. I'm ashamed about the whole incident, but not ashamed enough to ask for your help. I was sitting in the flowing bowl when the most fetching Nord woman you've ever seen walked in with an equally attractive Imperial woman following. After we exchanged words, I followed them out to a farmhouse. Inside, they asked me to remove my clothes and items. Well, I did. And then suddenly they brandished weapons and robbed me. They sent me away with barely a stitch of clothing, harlots. Just please help me get that ring back. I want to save what's left of my marriage. Gogan tells us the same story that Malona told us, this time with more details. Two women approached him at the Flowing Bowl. They enticed him to come out to their farmhouse. He went there and they asked him to remove his clothing. When he did, they armed themselves and robbed him of everything he had. We're to go to the Flowing Bowl and see if we can spot anyone suspicious, or maybe two women who fit the bill, a Nord and an Imperial. Hopefully then, we can retrieve the ring that Gogan had stolen from him. We make our way inside of the Flowing Bowl. Scoping the joint out, we notice two women walk into the tavern, exactly as Gogan described. When training other fighters I, I haven't seen you group, here before. You have to be a Aww. Of the and you're before all alone you. too. How sad. Well, if you're up to it, I think we can solve that little problem. You see, me and Faustina here are lonely too. And we've been looking for someone. You look like just what we need. I'll tell you what. We have a cozy farmhouse not far from here where we could, well, get to know each other much, much better. I'll mark it down on your map just so you won't forget where to find us. Meet us there around 11 o'clock. I can promise you a night of fun you won't soon forget. Do I really have to spell it out for you? You're a man, and I'm a woman with a certain desire. You figure out the rest. Don't keep us... Can't wait to see you later. Don't keep us waiting. Hope you're not planning to get much sleep. Signy Homewrecker and Faustina Karsha approached us and tried to charm us into visiting their farmhouse. We will be going to their farmhouse, but what they don't know is that we're on to their little scheme. Looking at our map, the farmhouse is located slightly southeast of Anvil. We fast travel to the stables, mount our horse, and ride the short distance over to Guidon Farm. Arriving at the farm, the journal updates and says we should only enter inside at around 11 in the evening. So, we wait a few hours, and then enter into the property. We're immediately greeted by Faustina, and she has this to say. I see you took us up on our offer. Good. I'm glad to see you. Signy will be along shortly. I'm sure we can find something to do while we wait. Now, we can't have you standing there all uncomfortable in all those clothes. Why don't you take everything off and place it there on the table? What? What are you talking about? Don't you want to have fun? Come on, don't be shy. Or are you here for something else? Damn, I knew it. You're working for the city guard, aren't you? I didn't think they would be stupid enough to send someone alone. But so be it. I should have known after I fenced that stupid ring and discovered it was a fake. Worthless! All part of the guard's plan, I suppose. Okay, girls, we got someone who doesn't want to cooperate. At this point, Signy, the woman we met back at the Flowing Bowl, and a Khajiit we've never seen before appear from the shadows. They're hostile towards us and begin attacking. Interestingly, Faustina ran to the corner and simply just watched the fighting from a distance. Lucky for us, the damage dealt by the gang members was minuscule. Also, since they didn't wear any armor, their health was dropping with every hit we landed. Soon, we delivered the killing blow to Signy, and then, we were able to make quick work of Serena, 
the third member of the gang. After going through the same dialogue with Faustina, she finally decided to challenge us. She pulled out her unique dagger, wit splinter, and began draining our intelligence. Faustina was actually able to cast some spells on us, with an emphasis on destruction magic. I never felt like I was in danger during this fight, but she was getting some good hits in on us. But soon, with some nicely timed heavy attacks, Faustina also fell to our blade. We get a quest update, and in walks some familiar faces. We had a feeling you'd be surprised when you saw us in our real uniforms. I see you have a puzzled look on your face. Ask away. Gogan and I are really members of the Anvil City Watch. I suppose you could say we work undercover. We've been trying to foil Faustina's gang for months now. Every time we tried to interview a man who was lured there, they refused to talk. The women in the gang picked married men to seduce for just that reason. It was decided the only way to stop this gang was to send in a stranger. You fit the bill perfectly. It's a shame it had to end in so much violence. But someone was bound to get hurt sooner or later. We'll clean up the mess. Don't concern yourself about it. I'm sure you had no choice. If you ever find yourself back in Anvil, stop by any time and say hello. Oh, and please say nothing to anyone about our true identities. You've done well, and here's the reward that I promised. A little busy right now. Got your mess to clean up. So in walked Gogan and Malona. They revealed to us that they're actually undercover guards for the City Watch. They've been trying to put an end to Faustina and her gang's ruse for quite some time. It was decided that a stranger was best to send in for this, which was us. We were told we needed to retrieve a ring, but in reality, I guess they just wanted us to kill the gang? I'm not sure what they thought was going to happen here other than violence and bloodshed, and they were for sure way too late on coming inside to offer a hand. So, if anything, it seemed like a pretty irresponsible job on their end. We managed to loot a key to the basement off of one of their bodies. Descending the stairs, we can see that this is where the gang would eat and sleep, having the upstairs as a fake showroom. In a little side room, we actually get to see their stockpile of stolen goods. There are shirts, gems, weapons, and other valuable items. We even see some familiar names like Pinaris. We grabbed as much loot as we could carry and exited the farmhouse. Thus, ending the quest, The Siren's Deception. The next quest for today is titled The Killing Fields. The quest begins with us in the city of Coral. If we find ourselves in the Grey Mare, we will likely hear the desperate pleas from an older gentleman with regards to the whereabouts of his sons. Speaking with the man, Vallis Odil, sounds like this. My sons. Have you seen my sons? Yes, Rallis and Antus. They're going to fight off the creatures at our farm, but I fear for their safety. For the last few days, we've suffered attacks from these creatures at our farm not far from Coral. They're coming from someplace in the Great Forest. I don't know where, but Rallis may know more by now. My boys will take up the fight, even if the guards won't. Doesn't matter if it's outside the town walls, it still affects us all. They expect me to go with them, but I... I fear in my old age I'm not the warrior I once was. Would you... Would you go in my place? Somehow, I knew you'd do the right thing. I'm supposed to meet them at Wayne and Priory. You'd best get whatever supplies you need now, so you can get there in time. I... I need a drink to calm my nerves. Please, excuse me. Vallis has asked us to take his place in the fight for the Odil family farm. We accept and are to meet his sons, Rallis and Antis, at Wanian Priory. We aren't sure what these creatures are, so we should be prepared for anything. We fast travel to Wanian Priory and bring our horse along. This way, if the fighting is tougher than expected, we'll at least have an extra companion to aid us. Rallis and Antis can be seen standing at the crossroads between the Priory and Coral. We gallop over and speak with Rallis. I'm afraid I have no time for small talk, friend. I'm waiting for my father, Vallis Odil. Have you seen him in town by any chance? He 
is not coming with us? I think I understand, and it is better that he remains safe. I wonder why he has asked you to take his place. You would join us, though you have no personal stake in this fight? Hm, an honorable deed. I gladly accept your help, then. There's no point in waiting here any longer. Follow me. We can't keep stopping to talk like this! We've got to get out there and fight! Both of Vallis's sons are eager to reclaim their family's farm. Together, we all set out east. The brothers walk over to their land, which is an incredibly slow process. It also doesn't help that we're on a horse, so we have to ensure that we're going extra slow. Eventually, we make it to their property and situate ourselves in the middle of their crop field. Admittedly, I knew what was at stake, in terms of a reward, if one of the brothers ends up dying. So, I wanted to make sure that we were on the front lines and would take a majority of the aggro. There are three waves of creatures that come for us at the farm. Spoiler, these creatures are goblins, and while they aren't the hardest of enemies to defeat, they shouldn't be taken lightly either. The first wave saw us battling three goblin skirmishers. I made sure to meet them at the fences of the field in order to take on as much heat as possible. Two of the goblins latched onto me, which meant that the brothers only had to deal with one. We made quick work of the skirmishers, and the brothers were able to kill the third one. Before we even had time to properly assess our wounds, a wave of three more goblin skirmishers came running from the great forest. I forgot I had a scroll to conjure up a zombie, so I used that in order to take even more aggro away from the brothers. It worked well, and Antis even decided to come over and get some hits in on the goblins, thankfully without taking any damage. We made quick work of the three goblins, and the brothers were still fine with regards to their health. Similar to last time, almost immediately, another goblin raiding party came running up at us. My conjured zombie was still up for a bit, so the extra help was nice. This time, we faced three skirmishers and a regular goblin, but still, nothing to be too worried about. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to take on as much aggro as I'd like from the goblins, so I had to kill them as quickly as possible before they had the chance of overwhelming the brothers. Let's go see my father, and let him know of our victory! <laughs> we beat them! We slaughtered them all! Did you see? Did you see how well I fought? Through a flurry of heavy attacks, as well as Rallus and Antis being able to hold their own ground, we killed the last goblin, giving us the journal update that we should now return to Vallis and tell him the news. We fast traveled back to Coral and walked our way over to Vallis Odil's house. We entered inside, and he had this to say. Back. You're back, and you've brought my sons with you. How wonderful! Foul things. They deserve the death you brought them. My boys are safe. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for sticking with them and helping a foolish old man. Please, take this. I won't be needing it any longer. My battles are over. I plan to live out my days on the farm in peace and quiet. Vallis rewards us with Chilrend, a unique enchanted weapon. If one of the brothers had died, or if both of the brothers had died, this weapon would have been forfeit. I've been wanting Chilrend for this character for quite some time. The frost damage, the aesthetic, and it being a short sword all make it a great weapon to add to my character's arsenal given his build. Thus ending the quest, The Killing Fields. The next quest for today is titled Tears of the Savior. This quest begins with us being in the city of Leowin. We may find ourselves in the Mage's Guild Hall for various reasons. However, if we approach the Khajiit named Sidrasa, he has a proposition for us. Sidrasa of the Mage's Guild, evoker and alchemist, and also, in his scant free time, a trainer in alchemy. But, perhaps you are an adventurer? Could you assist me in acquiring something for my crystal collection? Straight to the point, eh? Good, I like that. 
I'm searching for some specific crystals known as Garadan's Tears. If you can locate these objects for me, I'd pay handsomely for each one. Wonderful. I had a good feeling about you from the moment that I saw you. I want you to bring me as many of Garidan's tears as you can find. If you do, I will pay you a fair bounty in gold for each one. I confess I have a weakness for crystals of a magical nature, and I must add these to my collection. This is a personal errand, you must understand, just between you and I. The Mage's Guild has nothing to do with it. The tears are not just a namesake. They're literally the frozen tears of a knight named Garadan Staurus, who lived many years ago. I'm not certain what happened to the knight or why the tears were frozen, but I do know someone you could ask. Seek out Juliana Fanis at the Arcane University in the Imperial City. She oversees the Alchemy Headquarters there. If anyone can help you get more information about these crystals, she can. The tears are small crystals, bluish in appearance. Quite beautiful, I'd imagine. Through a rather lengthy proposal, Sidrasa wants us to find and bring back these crystals known as Garadan's Tears. Garadan Stalrus was a knight who lived many years ago. It's unknown why his tears were frozen or what happened to him. We're directed over to Julian Fanis of the Arcane University for more information. We fast travel to the Imperial City and seek her out in the Archmage's lobby. What can I help you with? You aren't the first person to go looking for those. Quite a remarkable story, really. I know a bit about it. Certainly. Garretton was a knight who lorded over a small village of peaceful farmers. One harvest summer, there was a horrible drought. The farmers appealed to Garadan to discover a solution. He spent a week consulting with sages, until one of them mentioned a possibility. The sage told him of an artifact called the Everflow Ewer. The vessel, which looked like a silver pitcher, was said to supply endless water. Yes, indeed. Legend has it that Garadan found the Ewer and that it was guarded by a fearsome creature. It is also said that the creature froze him. When Garadan realized his quest was a failure and he wouldn't be able to return and save the farmers, he began to shed some tears. As the ice enveloped him, some of his tears were frozen as well. Some even say that the divine Mara took pity on the poor knight. To commemorate his kind heart, she imbued the tears with some sort of magical power. That's only rumor, though. You know, if you're really interested in more, there's a book I read once called Nightfall. It may have more about Garadan. I think I saw a copy last time I was at the first edition bookshop in the Market District. I wish I could tell you more about them, but that's all I remember from speaking to my colleagues here at the university. We received a rather lengthy and detailed lore lesson on Garrett and Stalaris, which I rather enjoyed. Our next step is to head over to the first edition bookstore and purchase the book titled Nightfall. Reading it, we're likely to find out more information on the whereabouts of the tears. We fast travel to the Imperial City Marketplace and enter inside of the first edition. We speak with Fintius, take a look at his wares, and purchase Nightfall. Our character reads the book and a journal entry update pops up. It says that the book details the quest for the Everflow Ewer, in a place called Frostfire Glade. It's located in the mountains of Bruma, and we're able to deduce where using some points of reference. We need to find some special refined salts in order to enter the glade. We're now directed to return to Julian Fanis and ask her for some more clarification. We fast travel back to her, and she has this to say. Anything else I can help with? 
Yes, I have them for sale. If you'd like to buy some, feel free. They're top quality. I refined them myself. We went ahead and purchased three samples of refined frost salts from Julianne. I wasn't sure how many we needed for this quest, but further research suggests that only buying one could have sufficed. This next part isn't necessary, but I did read a little bit into the quest, and returning back to Zadrasa and Leowin is suggested. We seek him out and speak with him. May the wind be- May I help with any last minute preparations? Well, if what you learned is accurate, then you must protect yourself. It sounds like the cold in the glade is so severe that it could harm you. Perhaps these potions will help. Yes, I've heard of mages who seal portals with an ingredient as a key. Makes the door impossible to lockpick. Refined frost salts sounds like something that Juliana would specialize in. You may want to go back to the university and speak to her. There isn't much else I can do to equip you for this journey, only to wish you luck. Sidrasa shares a little more information with us. He tells us that the extreme cold of Frostfire Glade is likely going to hurt us. So, he gives us five potions to help out with that problem. He also reveals that mages use ingredients to lock and unlock doors, which is likely why we'll need the refined frost salts. With all of that in mind, we ready ourselves and fast travel over to Red Ruby Cave, which is just northwest of Frostfire Glade. It's a short walk over to the glade. We arrive at the entrance and wander inside. Whilst here, the brunt of the enemies we face include wolves and rats. There really isn't anything too challenging in this cave. Very quickly, we happen across a misty, bright door that is unlike other doors we've come across within these caves. The journal updates and tells us that all we have to do is touch the door. We activate it and enter inside a Frostfire Glade. We appear to be in some form of a hidden valley. The journal updates yet again and tells us to beware of the extreme cold. We're now to begin searching for Garadin's Tears. Walking along the obvious pathway, we quickly happen across a frozen, icy area with a small spire in the middle of it. We're faced with the one and only enemy in this area the Frostfire Atronach Glade Guard. It aggroes onto us and begins attacking. We pull out a charged Sin Weaver and begin hacking away at the Atronach. With some patience and health management, we defeat the Glade Guard. Only at this point did I remember to consume the Filters of Frost word given to us by Sidrasa, which offer us a 100% resistance to frost for 45 seconds. This completely stopped our damage intake and gave us free reign to look for the tears. I wasn't sure exactly what we were looking for, so I jumped onto one of the boulders to make our way to the icy spire. We got a journal update, and it actually details what happened to Garadin. Garadin can be seen in the middle of the spire, facing down and battling a frost Atronach. He dropped his weapon and used the Ewer as a form of protection. The Atronach smashed the Ewer, and the magical waters reacted, freezing the Noble Knight and the Atronach forever. In front of the frozen battle, we managed to find our first frozen tier. There are five tiers altogether. They're actually scattered around the frozen zone, and some are harder to spot than others. While collecting them, we have to ensure that we're on top of our potion consumption and health. Eventually, we find all five tiers of the savior, and the journal says we can now return to Sidrasa. The game would not allow us to fast travel from this location, even though we were technically outside, but I do understand why. We traveled back out the way we came, and then made our way back to Leowin. We spoke with Sidrasa once more, and he had this to say. You look like you've seen some travel. You found five of the tears? Fantastic. This turned out better than I expected. Perhaps a little bit of a bonus is in order. They're the pride of my collection. We're given a reward of 800 gold, and thus ends the quest, Tears of the Savior. The next quest for today is titled, When the Vow Breaks. 
This quest begins with us in and around the county of Anvil. Just outside of the city's north gate, we'll come across a farmhouse called Whitman Farm. Entering inside, we'll be greeted by a Nord woman named Mava the Buxom. Want. If you see my good-for-nothing husband, Yalfi, tell him I want back what he stole from me. Perhaps you can help me. My husband's name is Yalfi the Contemptible. My father said I was a fool to marry him, but I didn't listen. At our wedding, my father gave us a family heirloom as a gift. Rock Shatter, a mace that's been in my family for many generations. Yalfi snatched Rock Shatter from our mantle and took off to find his fortune with the local marauder gang at Fort Strand. I want that mace back. Please, I don't think he's ever coming back, and I'd hate to lose such a precious heirloom to a gang of thugs. Mava told us that her husband, Bialfi, has taken her family heirloom, a weapon called Rock Shatter, to a nearby fort, Fort Strand, in order to make a fortune with the local Marauder Gang. We've agreed to raid the fort and retrieve Rock Shatter at any cost. Fort Strand is really close to Anvil, being a short horse ride to the east. We mount our horse and ride around the road that encircles the city. We quickly come to the fort and need to dispatch of two guard dogs before we go inside. Once done so, we enter through the door. There are two zones within Fort Strand. The first zone, simply called Fort Strand, sees us quickly facing off with two marauders. Both are wielding longswords and have heavy armor cuirasses. We do some damage on the orc with Chillrend, but soon switch to Sinweaver for a little more reach. We're able to kill off one marauder, then the second one soon falls too. While inside, there are a few rats who try to attack us, but they really aren't much of a problem. We find the door leading to the next zone, but choosing to explore a bit more, we come across two more marauders. We cheese our fight with the mage and shoot her down with arrows. We're easily able to then cut down the marauder wielding a two-handed claymore. We loot some relatively lackluster treasure, then head back up and through the doors to the second zone. Fort Strand Great Dome is where Bjolfi can be found. He's surrounded by two marauders, so it's best if we pull them out one at a time. We shoot at the normal marauder and cut him down with Sinweaver. The next one to make an appearance is a marauder warlord. We're able to just aggro them via line of sight. He dons a dwarven cuirass and greaves and attacks using a steel claymore. Fortunately for us, he doesn't hit incredibly hard while we're blocking, and his health isn't amazing either. With a fully charged Sinweaver, we hack him down using a few heavy blows. Finally, we're able to charge into the room and face Bialfi head on. Bialfi the Contemptible aggros onto us and takes out the family heirloom, Rock Shatter. He dons a complete dwarven set, and even while blocking, the enchanted mace takes out a chunk of our health. We're able to best him in combat, however, using the reach of Sinweaver and well-timed heavy attacks. He soon falls to our elven claymore. We pick up Rock Shatter and get the quest update saying we should now return back to Mava. On the way out, we face a Marauder Archer, who wasn't much of a threat. We also face a Marauder Battle Mage and another Marauder Archer, who we best in combat too. Exiting the fort, we fast travel back to Whitman and enter back inside the farmhouse to speak with Mava. Very surprised. Found Rock Shatter yet, by chance? I'd already convinced myself I'd never see Rock Shatter again, but I was wrong. What's become of Yalfi? He was a good man when I married him, but greed took a hold of his heart. While I'm not happy he's dead, I'm glad he's at peace. Well, I'm just glad that it's all over and Rock Shatter is back where it belongs, in my family. I feel I owe you something for your efforts. Hmm, yes, I feel it only appropriate that you have my dowry. I would consider it an honor. We're given a reward of 195 gold and thus ends the quest when the vow breaks. As a side note, we can actually steal Rock Shatter back from Mava and use it as our own weapon. She has it equipped most times during the day, so if we break into her farm during the night and sneak up on her while she's asleep, we can steal it from her inventory. Unfortunately, I'm not really using blunt weapons on this character right now, but it's certainly a cool mace to have. The next quest for today is titled Goblin Trouble. 
This quest begins with us discovering a camp of wanderers in the Nibine Basin, southeast of the Imperial City and northeast of Breville. The camp is called Crestbridge Camp, and arriving there, we begin to speak with all of the residents. Well met. Come, warm yourself by our fire. Be seeing you. Welcome, traveler. We're all so worried about the goblins, we may not be as hospitable as we should be. Everything was going well. We had set up camp at Cropsford, and it looked like a beautiful spot. Then the goblins attacked. Thank Ifra that Marissa was there. Without her, the goblins would have surely killed us all. It was my father's dream for us all to start a new life there. He spent everything he had to buy the land. Now it all seems to be ruined. My father hired her as a guide at an inn south of here. Good thing too. She saved our lives and led us safely back here after the goblin attack. Bath El Garnard is my father. I'm worried about him. I think it'll break his heart if we can't build Cropsford. Bye. Hello, my friend. A word of advice. Watch for goblins if you're heading north. She's a wilderness guide we hired to lead our expedition to Cropsford. Saved our lives when the goblins attacked. Watch out for them if you're heading north. We ran into goblin war parties northwest of here while starting to build a new settlement. My family and I are still trying to figure out what to do. We spent everything we had to buy the land and supplies, so we can hardly go back. Say, do you think you could help us? We need to get the goblins off our land so we can start building our new settlement. I had a good feeling about you, friend. You should talk to Marisa about the goblins. She's our guide and knows what needs to be done. It's northwest of here along the Yellow Road. You'll see some of our supplies near the road where we left them when the goblins attacked. Have you made any progress? Is it safe for us to go to Cropsford yet? We plan to call it Cropsford. My daughter Kalia, her husband Alois and I came all the way from High Rock to start a new life here. We have a charter from the county. Everything done official and by the book. I'm sure now that they knew all along that the hand was in goblin territory. But no matter... Who cares if a few settlers get themselves killed? Bye. If you need anything, talk to my father-in-law. This whole expedition was his idea. Barthel Garnand. He talked us into selling our comfortable house in High Rock to start a new settlement here in Cyrodiil. He read something about cheap land being offered by the government. Of course, nobody said anything about the swarming goblins. If you ask Barthel, it's the garden spot of Tamriel. See for yourself. It's just northwest of here, but watch out for the goblins. We had just set up at Cropsford when Marissa came running in, said goblins were heading our way. We barely escaped with our lives. What do you want? You've agreed to help them clear the goblins from Cropsford? That's great news. I've done some scouting around while we've been camped here, and it looks like Cropsford is right in the middle of a goblin war. The caves around here are infested with goblins. Normally, goblins stay close to their lairs and wouldn't be a huge problem. But two tribes are at war, and their war parties are crossing right through Cropsford. What you'll need to do is stop the war somehow. Goblins have their own reasons for doing things. Don't make sense to us, usually, but I've learned a lot about their ways over the years. Each tribe guards a head in its lair. Whose head, I don't know. A sacred tribal totem or something like that. Anyway, if you want to rile up a goblin tribe, steal their tribal head which is often what a rival tribe does, just to prove they're tougher. I'd lay odds that the war between the two tribes is because of a stolen tribal head, nor the reason for a war to go on this long. So to stop the war, all you need to do 
that sneak into Timbersguard Cave, find the stolen tribal head, and return it to the Crackwood Cave Goblins. Unless you want to do things the hard way. Well, you could always just fight your way into Crackwood Cave and kill their shaman. Every goblin tribe is led by a shaman, but she mostly stays hidden in the heart of the lair, well protected. But kill the shaman, and the tribe will dissolve into confusion, most likely end the war. Follow the yellow road northwest from here. You'll see the supplies they had to abandon when the goblins attacked. The two nearest are Timberscar Cave and Cracked Wood Cave. Here, I've marked them on your map. Unfortunately, Cropsford is right in between them. Like I told you, there are only two ways to stop a goblin war. Either kill the attacking tribe's shaman or recover the tribal head from the rival tribe, which is likely the cause of the war. Neither one sounds like a picnic to me. So, that was a lengthy sequence of dialogue, but... We heard from the family as well as Hired Wilderness Guide that goblins have been attacking them over on their new property. Cropsford, as they call it, is the central battleground between two rival tribes of goblins. In order to put an end to the goblin war, we either have to sneak into one cave, retrieve a stolen totem, and then return it to the rival tribe in the other cave. Or, we can simply wander into Cracked Wood Cave and kill that tribe's shaman, which will plummet the group of goblins into chaos ultimately ending the Goblin War. To be honest, stealing the totem sounded more interesting to me, but this character isn't much for sneaking. Plus, it sounded like a little more work and likely would have resulted in an equal amount of bloodshed. But I do admit, it's probably the more fun and interesting option. Along the way to Crackedwood Cave, we come across the barely built settlement of Cropsford. There's certainly potential here if the goblins are taken care of. Speaking of goblins, nearing our destination, we were ambushed by a party of three Bloody Hand Goblin skirmishers. They weren't incredibly tough, but they fared better against Chilren than I would have hoped. After defeating all three, we arrive near the entrance and fight another skirmisher. This time, we used Sin Weaver, and with no charge, it did about the same damage as Chilren. Dispatching the Goblin Guard, we entered inside of the cave. There's only one zone that we need to go through for this quest. The first room we happen across contains their dining setup. It's complete with tables, stools, plates, cutlery, and food. We find ourselves the Bloody Hand Chef, but these goblins don't really like to fight. They're quite quick too. Thinking that the chef came back for a fight, we actually placed a few arrows in the body of their rat farmer. It too ran away. We followed the goblin and eventually found the chef and cut it down. The next room contained a few regular Bloody Hand goblins. With a charged sin weaver, their health dropped quickly and their attacks were negligible. Standing in a corner, we found the rat farmer and managed to kill it as well. The next area was where it got a little tricky. I could see from the compass that the shaman was down there, but I couldn't see how well guarded she was. So, seeing a goblin standing idle, we fired an arrow at them and managed to pull two others with it. The first goblin we took down was a berserker. They fought with a mace, but were really no better than a skirmisher. The next one was a basic goblin, and they were simple enough to cut down. Finally, the last one was a skirmisher who was firing arrows at us. We got in close enough to deal some melee damage, pulled them away from the danger zone, and then finished them off in the other room. A straggler bloody hand goblin came running up afterwards, so we killed it with a fully charged sin weaver. Now it was time to face the shaman. We got in close enough to aggro it, and then started to run backwards. It was guarded by a bloody hand goblin, which we focused at first, but quickly switched over to the shaman. The shaman summoned a zombie which helped it inflict some damage on us. The shaman was incredibly strong with the damage it dealt, and honestly, there was a good chance that we could have lost this fight. A few heavy attacks later, and we were able to best the shaman. We cut down its guard right after, and then received the quest update. We ventured a bit further, and fought the goblin warchief. It was stronger than the skirmishers, but not as strong as the shaman. We looted some chests and then left the cave. Fast traveling back to Crestbridge camp, we spoke with Barthel. Let me know as soon as Cropsford is cleared of goblins, so we can get back to building our new settlement. You took care of the goblin menace? That's great news, my friend. Now we can get back to building our new lives at Cropsford. 
Please, be sure to come and visit us in a month or so. You have earned a hero's welcome. Come back in a few weeks. You may be surprised at what we can accomplish. No reward is given out, and thus ends the quest, Goblin Trouble. So, reading how the other option for the quest turns out, I think I would have liked to have done it that way. Yes, there is some sneaking, but it's optional, and definitely does sound more interesting to me than the route we took. I also didn't know that you only had to leave the totem outside of Cracked Wood Cave, making it a little easier than going all the way in and infiltrating the goblins. Funny enough, we can even return the totem to the Rockbiter tribe after Cropsford has been resettled and the Goblin War starts back up, leaving the settlers in the middle again. Interestingly, once Cropsford is built, there is a respawning reward chest that contains a leveled amount of gold that we can take from, which is ultimately our reward for completing this quest. The final quest for today is titled The Gravefinder's Repose. We begin this quest by wandering along the Red Ring Road, just north of the Imperial City. If we find ourselves outside of the Roxy Inn and choose to enter inside, we may speak with the publican, Maylene, who will ask of us a favor. I don't know how to make this request any simpler, but to put it bluntly, Raylan the Gravefinder must die. A few months ago, that witch of a necromancer decided to inhabit Moss Rock Cavern just north of my inn. I don't know what she does in there. Frankly, I don't want to know. However, I do know that after she arrived, the woods at night became unsafe. I've seen undead of all types walking in the dark woods near the cave entrance. Now this area is getting a bad reputation, and my business has waned. Every day, it seems the number of undead increase. If someone can get into the cave and kill Raylan, maybe we can stem the tide. Her death pays a handsome bounty. I hope you'll take advantage of the opportunity. Maylene asks us to head to Moss Rock Cavern, a cave just north of here, and kill a necromancer who's taken up residence inside of it. Raylan, the necromancer in question, has made the woods unsafe in turn, making business bad for the inn. So, there's a bounty in it for us if we complete it. The cave is a short walk north. We head there and enter inside. We first face off with a rat and a zombie. The latter of the two most certainly a creation of Raylan's. The rat dies easily, and the zombie goes down after a few swings with Sinweaver. Looking around the room, it appears we can get to Raylan fairly easily if we chose to pick the lock of a door. However, given it was a hard lock and I wanted to explore a bit, we chose to wander around the cave. Going through the other path, we faced two more zombies in the next room. Hitting them with Sinweaver, they weren't very difficult to kill, and soon, both fell to the elven claymore. Next up was a rat and a mud crab, which were pretty negligible. The next room saw us fighting two zombies and a skeleton guardian. We swung away at the zombies and dropped both of them. We went in for close combat against the Skeleton Guardian, and I was impressed with how strong it was. Its health was barely going down. Thankfully for us, it was just an archer so it was slow to attack. We kept hacking away at it with Chillrend when it ran up to higher ground. Up there, after we followed, we were met with another Skeleton Guardian. This one wielded a mace and a shield. We switched targets and began battling the mace user. This one's health was also taking its time to go down. We charged back up and finished off the archer. With a flurry of heavy attacks and a few well-timed light attacks, we defeated the second skeleton guardian. Venturing to the next room, we were met with a necromancer. She conjured a skeleton to fight for her, but we ignored it and pressed on to attack her. Her destruction magic took away some of our health, but a few nice swings with Sinweaver and she was dead. In a chest near a statue, we found the necromancer's moss rock key. This is what we needed to get to Raylan without lockpicking. We backtracked to the first room and went to the locked door. Opening it, we were instantly aggroed by Raylan the Gravefinder. She conjured a skeleton to fight with her. We also aggroed another necromancer in the room who conjured a headless zombie to join the fight as well. Focusing on Raylan, we dealt quite a few heavy attacks on her. She soon fell dead and her conjured skeleton went back to the abyss. We received a journal update, but had to take care of this last necromancer. A few swings with Sinweaver, and she joined those whose eternal slumber in which she interrupts. We do some looting, and then exit the cave. 
Making our way back to Roxy Inn, we speak with Maylene. I assume you've dealt with Raylan appropriately. I realize it's in poor taste to celebrate anyone's demise, but Raylan was evil through and through. You've done the right thing. I believe we had a contract. Here's my part. We're rewarded 220 gold, and thus ends the quest, The Gravefinder's Repose. So, with all seven quests completed, it's now time to do a subjective ranking of least fun to most fun quests. Obviously, these are all my opinion. So, if you'd like to share your ranked list below, I'd love to hear it. I also understand that it isn't totally fair to pin some of these quests up against one another, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'd also like to say that I actually did enjoy all of these quests, but some were just better than others to me. In 7th for me was the quest, The Gravefinder's Repose. It was a simple, cut and dry, go to this cave, kill this boss, and return to the quest giver for a reward. I liked how they at least didn't make us travel too far to get to the cave, with it being probably around 100 or so meters away. I also liked how if we wanted to, we could simply pick the lock to the door, kill Raylan, and be done with it. It was also neat to see the Daedric influences around the cave system. But overall, I didn't find it that entertaining. In 6th for me would probably be the quest, When the Vow Breaks. Honestly, it didn't offer much more entertainment value than the previous quest. Its saving grace was that we can obtain Rock Shatter at the end, and the loot we found around Fort Strand was better suited for my character's build. Similar to the last one, we didn't have to travel too far from Whitman Farm to Fort Strand. But overall, it was a fetch quest that gives us the chance to illegally obtain an enchanted weapon after the fact. In fifth for me is the quest The Killing Fields. I actually enjoyed this quest quite a bit. It wasn't too long, our reward is dependent on our action slash ability to fight, and it's all for a good cause. I actually felt a sense of duty to protect Valis's sons. Also, I'm a sucker for wave-based fighting. The quest only got this placement on this list simply because I enjoyed the other four a little bit more. In fourth, I put the quest Goblin Trouble. I'm familiar with the concept of the Goblin Wars, so this quest really intrigued me. I really enjoyed the lore lesson from Marisa on goblins and their rival tribes. I also enjoyed the concept of having two different options for completing this quest. I wish I had got to experience the alternative pathway to the one I chose, but that one's ultimately on me. It felt good helping the people of Cropsford, and I'm excited to see the settlement when it's fully built and we can claim our reward. The third most fun quest for me was Imperial Corruption. I will admit, I didn't like this one as much as Corruption and Conscience, which takes place in Shadenhall, but it was still interesting. Some of my favorite quests in Oblivion are completely based around dialogue and conversation pathways. This quest certainly delivered on what I like to experience. It was ironic how everyone needed to be bribed, including the city guard, in order to lock away the corrupt watchman, but I understand that's a skill issue with my character. All throughout the quest, it never really felt like Audens was a bad guy. He never really gave off any emotion or aroma or dialogue that he was up to no good, and only at the end when he started to threaten us, Rustlin, and the Ronk, did he seem evil. The part that took the cake for me though was Audens escape from jail. His targeted murder attempt against us, along with the ramblings we found in his body, were really neat to see. The second most fun quest for me was the Siren's Deception. I found the whole concept extremely fascinating. An all-female gang that seduces men into following them to their cabin. Once the men take their clothes off, the women arm themselves and rob the men of everything they have. The city guard can't get anyone to talk though because they're all too embarrassed of what happened. We're misled by undercover guards into following along with their scheme in order to retrieve a family heirloom that never even existed. Things go sour and we have to kill the entire gang. Then, the guards come in and all is revealed. To me, it's really interesting and a unique concept for the Elder Scrolls universe. Plus, it was really neat to see the stolen belongings of Anvil's men whom most we've come into contact with before. Finally. In first place for most fun is the quest, Tears of the Savior. I understand that this could be controversial for some people. It's a glorified fetch quest that has us jumping around from person to person. Believe me, I understand that it's not for everyone. 
I also went into this quest with the mindset that it was going to be a boring fetch quest, and I think that's partially why it got number one. I really enjoyed the lore aspect of this quest. I got to learn about Garadin Stalrus. I learned about his frozen, crystallized tears. I also learned that some mages lock doors via alchemical ingredients. I found all of the history lessons between Sidrasa and Julien quite interesting, and I liked how Frostfire Glade wasn't too long of an adventure. We did a quick and easy dungeon crawl through the cave, arrived at the door, and wandered inside of the glade. I found the concept of this hidden valley really neat, and it sort of reminded me of the Pale Pass during Lifting the Veil. The battle with the Atronach was brief, but fun, and the concept of the extreme cold damaging us, in my opinion, was well executed. We got to see what had happened to Garadin, and we secured all five tiers for a pretty plentiful reward. Overall, while I understand it may be ludicrous to some of you that it's at number one, I hope that some of you also may agree with me. Regardless if you do or do not, I'd love to hear your list of these quests ranked from least fun to most fun. Until next time, keep on adventuring.